Today I want to share with you how to make cottage cheese the easy way. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods including bone broth, ferments, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. So I call this cottage cheese the easy way because we're going to make this without the need for rennet. And rennet is something that's used in the commercial cheese industry to make cheese, but it's often not something that we as home cooks have on hand. Now you can certainly buy rennet, uh, you may have to order it or find it at a specialty grocery store, and you can use that to make cheese at home. But for the most part, it's nice to be able to make cheese without having to worry about having that on hand. So today we're gonna make cottage cheese using just milk and vinegar. Now, as I said, this is the easy cottage cheese. Is it exactly like the cottage cheese that you buy at the grocery store that may be made with rennet? No, but it's going to be very similar. And as I said, it's very easy to make. And cottage cheese, like a number of other cheeses, are what I think of as on sort of a continuum of cheeses that are made on the stovetop in a pot or a saucepan. And as a matter of fact, you may even have heard of old-fashioned pot cheese. And that's sort of on this continuum of cheese making at home, so to speak, uh, where you have cottage cheese, you have pot cheese, you have farmer's cheese, and you have ricotta cheese. And again, now that's sort of the easy ricotta cheese. It's not the true ricotta cheese that's made from the whey after making mozzarella, but it's a ricotta cheese that's made in a similar way to making cottage cheese like this in the saucepan. And I'll make a video about how to make ricotta in that way uh, another time. But I just wanted to give you that little sort of overall picture that these are all similar cheeses, easy made cheeses, like the cottage cheese, the ricotta, the pot cheese, the farmer's cheese. And the only real difference is um, exactly what temperature you're going to warm the milk to, whether or not you're going to add cream, whether or not you're going to add salt, how long you're going to heat it for, what temperature, so on and so forth. So they're all slight variations and they produce a slightly different product. But basically, they're all easy cheeses that are made right on your stovetop. And the nice thing about all of these stovetop cheeses is they're all made without the need for rennet. Okay, the class lecture is over. Let's make the cottage cheese. So basically to start, all you need are two ingredients. You're gonna want one gallon of milk and three quarters of a cup of white distilled vinegar. Now you can also keep some salt and some cream on hand, but we'll talk about that because that comes after we've made the cottage cheese. And you can use raw milk or you can use pasteurized milk. And another nice thing about making homemade cottage cheese is that you can use skim milk, also known as non-fat milk. You can use 2% milk or you can use whole milk. So you can make this any way you want. And the nice thing, as I said, about making this homemade and being able to choose what type of milk you want, if you're following um, diet plans like the Trim Healthy Mama program and you need fat-free cottage cheese, you can make this version at home with non-fat or, or skim milk, and it's going to be much tastier and much nicer than the product that you can get at the grocery store that's called fat-free cottage cheese. Well, what I've got here is pasteurized whole milk, and I'm making this with pasteurized whole milk because that's the easiest milk, I think, for most of you to find. But as I said, you can also make this with raw milk, which I have access to, but I know a lot of you have told me that you don't have access to that. So just go ahead and pour, have a nice big heavy saucepan. Uh, this is an enamel cast iron pan, uh, a heavy uh, stainless steel, a heavy bottomed stainless steel pan will work well as all, will work well, well as well. <laughs> so this is, as I said, cast iron stainless or a heavy bottom stainless steel. Pour all of your milk in. Now the next thing we wanna do is heat this milk gently 
because milk you have to be careful with when you're warming because it can burn, uh, especially on the bottom. So we just want to put this on about a medium heat and we want to keep our eye on it and we only want to heat this up to about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now if you have a food grade thermometer and you can monitor this to bring it up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, that's great. But if you don't, don't worry. Basically what you'll want to do is keep an eye on it and with clean hands, test it periodically, you know, with one of your fingers to see if it's becoming warm, like a nice warm bath. And chances are that's going to be the right temperature. And as you're bringing this up to a nice warm temperature, just periodically give it a little stir just to make sure nothing's sticking to the bottom and that and Check it, as I said, periodically. You don't want to get it too hot. Just a nice, warm bath temperature. Well, my milk has come up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm just going to, with clean hands, I'm going to show you. Just put your finger in. Feels very warm. Now, my fingers, my hands are very seasoned from years of cooking, uh, so it might feel quite warm to you. Um, I kind of describe it as a warm bath. Some people might say a hot bath, uh, but the bottom line is it's going to take about 20 to 25 minutes to warm a gallon of milk on medium up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so, and you know, if you stick your finger in it and it feels very warm, then you know you've, you've reached the right temperature. Once we get to that 120 degrees, we're gonna remove this from the heat. Then we're gonna take our three quarters of a cup of white distilled vinegar, and this is just the typical 5% acidity level vinegar that you'd find at the grocery store. And we're gonna add this gently into our milk. Now, if you don't want to use vinegar, you can use lemon juice. However, the lemon juice gives more of a distinct lemon flavor instead of more of a uh, plain flavor that the vinegar imparts. And you're going to start to already see it begin to congeal. Now, you just want to give it a little very gentle mix around. And I'll take a picture from overhead so you can see how this looks. But you just want to stir it for about a minute, a minute or two, and you want to do it very gently, and you're going to start to see it begin to curdle. Now, all we're going to do is cover this pot, and we're going to let this sit here for 30 minutes. While this is resting, I just want to say one thing about getting your milk to the right temperature. I don't want you to worry about that. There's a lot of flexibility when making these homemade stovetop cheeses. So if it's a little under 120 or a little over 120, it's really not going to make a significant difference. And even on that continuum, continuum of cheeses that I talked about earlier, uh, the worst case scenario is that if it's a little under 120, you'll get a slightly different texture. Or if it's over 120 by any significant amount, maybe you went up to 180 or even 200 degrees, you'll get a little bit more of something that resembles a ricotta. So I don't want you to worry about that. It's going to turn out fine. And in the case of making cottage cheese, if you can put your finger into the milk and it feels warm or hot to you, you're fine. Well, it's been 30 minutes, so we'll check on this. Oh, it looks wonderful. I'll take a picture and I'll overlay it so you can see exactly what this looks like. The next thing you want to do is get a bowl uh, and a colander or a mesh drainer. Either one will work. And what we're going to do is take some uh, cheesecloth or a flour sack towel. If you've been with me a while and you've seen all my bone broth videos, you know I love using these flour sack towels. But you can use cheesecloth too or any very thin cloth. And we're going to line our colander or if you use a mesh strainer, that's fine too. And then what we're going to do is transfer all of this curds and whey through this lined colander. And you just want to be a little careful when you're doing this because it is still warm. Well, I'm letting this drain into my bowl. And as you'll see, I had to transfer the whey into this measuring cup, but there's still more that's dripping off. So I'm going to leave this for another five minutes and continue to let that whey drain off. 
But as this is draining, I'm going to take a picture and overlay it so that you can see exactly what the curds are starting to look like as all this whey is draining off. Now I just want to talk about this whey for a minute. This is what's known as acid whey. There's two types of whey. There's acid whey and then there's sweet whey. Acid whey is what we get when we drain yogurt or we drain kefir or we make a soft cheese like the type of cheese, the cheese we made today, cottage cheese, or any of the other stovetop cheeses. Stovetop cheeses that are known as soft cheeses. Sweet whey, on the other hand, is the byproduct of making hard cheeses or cheeses that are made where rennet is used. Sweet whey is very high in protein and uh, you may have seen it sold in stores when it's dehydrated and sold under the name of whey protein powder. Acid whey on the other hand is a lot lower in protein but don't throw it out. It's very rich in vitamins and minerals and it can be used in place of pretty much any recipe where water is called for. So if you're baking and it calls for water, you can use whey. You can use whey when you want to make grains. You can use whey when you're making rice. You can even use whey when you're making bone broth as your acid to help extract the collagen out of the bones and make a gelatinous bone broth. Now acid whey is the type of whey that's used when you make ferments. But I prefer not to use the whey uh, that I get when making the soft cheese on the stove because this has all been heated. I prefer to use this in all the other uh, applications that I just mentioned. When it comes to ferments, I prefer the acid whey that I collect when straining yogurt or straining kefir. And the reason for that is that even though the milk, for example, when you're making yogurt, the milk has been warmed, it's then been inoculated and then it's been refrigerated and the inoculation of that good bacteria has not been heated. Yes, it's been put into, the good bacteria has been put into milk that was brought up to 110 degrees. However, 110 degrees is still often considered somewhat of a living food and the bacteria can really proliferate and grow and is very vital, so to speak, uh, when strained from uh, yogurt. And then of course, extremely vital when, when strained from kefir because kefir has not been heated at all. But that's just in my humble opinion. I know that some people will use this whey for ferments, but I prefer uh, to use the whey that I strain from yogurt or kefir if I'm going to use it in a ferment. And one other thing I want to mention about using this whey, you can actually try and put this back into the pot, back onto the stove, add some more acid. You could add the vinegar or some lemon juice and see if you can get any more curds out of it. Now, the curds will be a little more similar to what you might, uh, or what might remind you of a ricotta cheese, but that's often fun to try to see if you can get any more uh, cheese out of this way. Well, I let this drain for another five minutes. I got some more whey, and I'm gonna overlay a picture so that you can see how beautiful this cottage cheese has turned out. It beautiful, large, lovely curds, and it's just looking glorious. Now, at this point, you have a couple of options. Some people like to put this up into a tight bowl and then rinse it under cold water for about three to five minutes. I've never really found that step necessary. The reason for putting this up into a tight bowl and squeezing it to get out as much of the whey as you can and then rinsing it real well uh, in that tight bowl, I'll show you what I mean uh, by just pulling all of this up, is then to rinse out any vinegar taste. But I generally find with just using three quarters of a cup of the vinegar or even a full cup of the vinegar that my cottage cheese really doesn't have a, vinegar, a vinegary flavor. But if you want to take that step, you would just pull this into, the, into a bowl in your cheesecloth or your flour sack towel, give it a good squeeze to get some of that whey to keep draining off and then 
put it under your tap and just turn on your cold water on your sink and rinse and rinse and rinse for about three to five minutes while you're squeezing, getting the water out and more of the whey. But what I find is that just by straining the cottage cheese, you have a beautiful texture as I'm showing you here. And, and I'll, I'll take a, an up close picture of this and I'll overlay it so that you can see it on the plate. But this is a lovely texture and we'll give it a taste, but I know from experience, it has a lovely flavor and not one that I find vinegary. So I often skip that step. And also too, I'm not a fan of washing this lovely product uh, with chlorinated water from my tap. And to try to rinse something for three to five minutes with filtered water, uh, especially I don't have an RO system or anything like that, uh, might become a little costly. Also too, I find that when you squeeze it really tight and you rinse it very thoroughly, you wind up with a very dry product. And that's where the cream comes in handy. If you decide to take that step where you're squeezing and rinsing, you're going to wind up with a cheese that's much drier. You're going to want to break it up into curds. And then if you want to get it to have more of the consistency of what you're used to at the, from what you buy at the grocery store, then you'll want to add in a little cream. And at that same time, you can go ahead and add in a little salt. Now you can even go ahead and add in salt to this, but I find with the vinegar, uh, the taste is really quite lovely. So let's give this batch a taste. Mmm, it's perfect. There's not a strong vinegar flavor at all, but the little tiny bit of tang that's left over is delightful. And I find that it really doesn't need any salt at all. So if you're on a salt restricted diet, this is a nice option because you really don't have to add any salt. And I don't even think you're going to miss the salt. Now, if you want, you can also still add some cream uh, to this unrinsed cottage version of the cottage cheese. Uh, it's really going to be just a matter of personal taste as to how close you want to get it to resemble what you might buy at the grocery store. But I highly recommend giving it a taste like this before you make any additions, because I think you're going to be very pleased. Now, whether you leave your cottage cheese just like this as is, or you bundle it up and rinse it under tap water, either way, this is going to stay fresh in your refrigerator for about five to seven days. And your whey has a wonderful shelf life. This is going to stay fresh in your refrigerator for about six months. And if you freeze it, even longer, at least a year. So if you'd like to learn more about homemade dairy products, be sure to click on this video over here where I show you how to make homemade yogurt, no machine required. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.